we're here this morning with Malcolm Bell of Mail Cloud. Welcome. Thank you. Fist pump. Fist pump. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess a good way to start would be perhaps maybe you giving us a little insight into your career. Yeah. Kind of how you started. I remember reading that you uh, sort of age 15 started your entrepreneurial road. So maybe you could give us a little insight. Yeah, sure. So I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, I'm 33 now, so getting older. Um, but I think my first business was when I was um, seven years old. I went to Disney World. Uh, Disney World, they had the Magic Kingdom and they had Main Street. And on Main Street, there was a magic shop. Uh, and as a seven-year-old impressionable child, I walked into this magic shop and was just taken completely by the magic. And so I became a magician uh, at the age of seven. And I would put on magic shows at home uh, and put up posters and charge my parents a pound each uh, to come and watch my magic. And that was my first, uh, that was my first business. Fast forward a few years, um, when I was 15, I think it was 98, I went to New York. Um, and whilst I was sort of familiar with computers, I was messing around with computers at home, my parents had uh, quite a few, everything on, on TV in the States was dot com this and dot com that. And I thought, you know, there's something really to this internet thing. And so on the plane on the way home, I bought HTML for dummies, um, the coding language. And so I read that. Within a week, I think, of getting back home, I set up a business called Webmasters Design uh, to design websites for local businesses. And that was pretty much the first kind of real digital business and the real way of making um, money. I then became very boring. Uh, I went to London School of Economics and I studied economic history. Uh, my parents wanted me to have a proper job, uh, to be something respectable like a lawyer or a banker. Um, and whilst I was there, I met a couple of, um, through my father, I met a couple of sort of property tycoons, investors, Robert and Vincent Chengiz, um, that had a company at that time called the Roche Property Group, a uh, huge investor, multi-billion pound portfolio, and so I kind of went to the Roche Property School of Finance. I worked with those guys for a couple of years. They taught me everything they know, they would say. And I worked then in the family office world and investment world for around eight or nine years. Um, before approaching the age of 30, had a midlife crisis, um, and just didn't really want to be in the world of investments anymore, especially after the crash. <laughs> and so uh, my wife was working at a bank. She had this crazy idea for a product that women could, could wear whilst they were working out, that would kind of heat them up, um, that would get more out of their workout. And I thought, that's a quirky idea. It's mad. Would heat them up. Would heat them up, exactly. So literally, pants that make you hot help you lose weight. Right. Um, and we could call them hot pants, and we could put together a website, and we could sell them online, and we could use social media. And in theory, I had this really great kind of explosive kind of marketing campaign in mind. So we set uh, up the website July 2011. Within 10 weeks of going live, we sold 100,000 products. Um, within 18 months, we bootstrapped to like $40 million in revenue, uh, profitable, no investors, no debt, customers in 140 countries. It was just truly insane. Um, and it just exploded. And so that was a business that grew. Between 2011 to 2013, we got up to around 50 people. All sales were really online. It was a purely kind of digital. We were a brand, not a retailer, so that had its own challenges. Um, but because it was a female customer base and it was a female product, whilst I love women, uh, I wasn't really the customer. And so um, when it came to October 2013, my wife and I had a baby. She had joined the business, left the bank. Um, I thought, you know what, I want to work on something that I actually have a passion for because unless you truly have a passion, I think, for what you do in life, all of the inevitable challenges and the hard things that you'll have to overcome uh, are just so much harder. And so I, th I wanted to solve a problem that I had, uh, which was really the inception for what is now MailCloud, which I've been working on for the, the past 18 months, I have a team of incredible engineers, um, and the, help, the, the vision always was to help people work easier and faster. Uh, but not exactly knowing how we're going to do that. So we've kind of begun this exploration journey. Um, and this time we raised money from investors, so we're sort of a venture-backed startup. Um, we raised 2.8 million from investors like Octopus Investments, and Investment Venture Partners, and a really amazing group of angels, all founders of you know, billion dollar companies. Um, and we're starting our beta um, for MailCloud on Monday, version 1.0 Nimbus. I did say, I was going to say, yeah. I, I did sign up. It's coming, and, uh, yeah, it's coming. So it's the Monday. Well, some people actually signed up uh, like a year ago, like February last yeah. year. The first thing we did actually was we created a landing page so people could register interest. Um, and so, yeah, so version 1.0. So maybe you could you give us a little insight into kind of what, what it is now? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea, as I said, was to kind of solve a problem that I had and something that I had a passion for. And I've always been, anyone who knows me knows that I pride myself on being the kind of the fastest hand in the West when it comes to replying to emails. Um, and so I'm a bit of a productivity nut. It's an OCD driven thing, um, for sure. And so in 2011, when sort of my first business, Agora, was taking off, I had 145,000 emails. 
uh, in yeah. that year, and that's like 400 a day, roughly, every day uh, of the year. And like most people, I ended up using um, email, I, I'd have my messenger apps, desktop, different from mobile. Uh, some people in the team would send me an SMS, then a Skype, then an email, then they'd come talk to me. Uh, we use sort of separately, you know, fast storage services like Dropbox and G Drive. Mm -hmm. Then we had our sort of project management apps like uh, Trello, or Basecamp. And so I had to spend so much time organizing my organization. I just thought, you know what, there has to be a better way um, of, of helping people work easier and faster, in particular on mobile, as the world was increasingly becoming more mobile-based in terms of its working. And so that was the vision. Um, the, the vision was that, you know, to build a service that people love that helps them work easier and faster on mobile and desktop. But I didn't really have a particular sort of feature set in mind, like what does that look like? What are the use cases? Who are we helping? How are we helping them? And so we set about with a team of a few engineers um, from some really amazing companies like Vodafone and Skype and, and elsewhere on kind of exploring what were the problems that people had, how could we actually build this feature set. So we've done by now like over a thousand in-person kind of interviews, we've built 70 plus prototypes. The first version actually is probably the fifth version that we've actually built. Um, and so MailCloud really is a service that you can use, all you have to do is connect to your existing email account, whether it's a Gmail account or Exchange. And the first thing that we do is we organize everything for you. Um, so the first thing is that we take your existing email account, which we simply think of as a key, and we securely take all of the files, all of the people, all of the topics from your mail, and we organize them neatly for you. So rather than have to, let's say, you know, search through your mail to find something, you could just simply look up my name, and on my contact card, you'd see all the emails, the files, the photos, the things that we've shared. Um, or you could look at just the PDFs that you received by mail, or just the PowerPoint. So just the PowerPoint. Right. Exactly. Um, also, you could create hashtags for topics, things that you're currently working on. So let's say you've got you know hot topics, interview with Malcolm, all of the things that are related to that, the mail or files um, from other people as well in the team you'd see under that hashtag. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that we're trying to put your content and your communication together. So if you think about the current way that a lot of people work is that there's this kind of universal constellation of services that you use. Uh, like I mentioned, there's the file storage services, then there's the email, then there's the messaging, then there's you know these specific kind of verticalized services that people use for project management, whether you're in a marketing team or if you're a lawyer or if you're an accountant, you kind of use special software. And so what we want to do is to put your content, like all of the files, all of the um, all of the emails in one place together that you can actually interact with other people around those things without having to leave the service. Right. So without having to go to Dropbox to send a file to someone, to have to app switch constantly and the friction around that. Um, and then the third thing really is integrations. So to be able to integrate your existing services like Dropbox, like Trello, like G Drive, um, Evernote, the services that you already use. So rather than unlike existing services like you know Slack, uh, you just end up with a flood or a stream of notifications and you're buried under them. You can actually action your mail with those services. So you can create an Evernote from an email. You can create a Trello card from an email. Um, you can see all of your Dropbox files in MailCloud and share them with other people um, securely. And so that's kind of what we're aiming, what we're aiming to achieve. Nice. But the magic of the product is only really felt when you kind of have it in your hands. Um, and so we're, 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 starting, we're, we're, starting, we're starting that on Monday. I mean, every, every day that's gone by over the last couple of months, I've become more and more excited as we make more and more progress on the product. Um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Okay, so, so I suppose my next question is, um, you know, you're, you're a serial entrepreneur, right? So obviously there's going to be some failures in that. Of course. Oh, are, are there any you're, you're willing to share? Yeah, I mean, I love talking about the failures. I mean, where do you want to start? Um, a seven magician. Yeah, so, well, the problem then was the market size wasn't very big. Uh, I had my parents that were willing to pay to come and see my, my magic shows. Uh, it was market size, so it wasn't a very total, it wasn't a big total addressable market. Um, so yeah, failures, I mean, in 2009, before I started Zagora, I left the family office that I was working for. I wanted to set up my own investment fund. Uh, with investors that I'd work with to take advantage of, which for what was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in particular for the real estate cycle. Um, and I slogged away for 18 months with a partner from JP Morgan and a partner that I'd worked with previously, and we totally failed. No one was, would give us any money. It was the right idea at totally the wrong time. Um, we left the family office that we were working for, and they just weren't the kind of people to give us the money that would sort of seed us. And so it was just a disaster. Um, at Zagora, which is acclaimed in a lot of places for being a huge success, we made so many mistakes. Um, you know, we, we allowed people to order from the website, and they could order from any country in the world. And so we had orders from customers in Vietnam, or we had orders from customers in Mongolia, even Iran. We had a couple of women from Tehran who ordered. 
and we had no idea how exactly we were going to ship them the product that they'd ordered. Uh, we hadn't figured out logistics at all, and that ended up as a bit of a mess. Um, but otherwise, I think that you know you have to do things that don't always work out, right? I mean, I think that's almost a sort of rite of passage mm -hmm. um, because there's so much that you can learn from the mistakes. So I think making mistakes is great. Um, and it's important to do that. A lot of people say it's important to fail and to fail fast. You know, failure is a good thing. Um, I kind of subscribe to the sort of Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz view of the world, which is actually that's not true. Uh, failure sucks. It's really bad. Like success is great, you know. But I think that it's important to kind of draw the life lessons and the execution and operational lessons that you can from things that don't kind of work out well. Mm -hmm. um, and so every entrepreneur that I've ever met has done something that didn't work out as intended. Um, and it's had success that they hadn't imagined equally. It's about that kind of zigzaggy part. Yeah, it's thing. just it's the it's the way of the samurai, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the, the life that you've you've chosen. Similar sort of within bigger corporate organisations, the, the the career path can be a greasy pot. One minute you're up, next you're down. Mm -hmm. Depends your boss changes, like you don't like them. And so as an entrepreneur, you know you kind of have a career, I think as well, whereby you know you obviously take far more responsibility for the execution the success and the failure. Um, but I actually quite like that. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are like that. They, they like to have the responsibility. They like to have that element of control, perhaps, over their own sort of destiny. And so if something doesn't work out, it's your fault. Um, and you have that element of control to decide what to do next. And I quite like that sort of freedom and that independence. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so, so, so what from, I don't know, perhaps your, your past failings or mistakes that you've made, you've made, you've kind of instilled into Melflap? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the mistakes I think that we made at Zagora was you know, the, the team grew so rapidly because you know, the, the demand, we were chasing demand for the first six months. And so we didn't put enough emphasis as quickly as we should have on things like company culture, team, um, the sort of the, the kind of business that we wanted to build, the sort of people we wanted to hire to be sure that the sort of values that we had as founders, my wife and I, and a friend of mine, um, that people shared those values and, and shared the vision for the business and understood what the mission was. Mm -hmm. So the way that I kind of liken it was, you know, how many of the initial team at Zagora would I have been happy to have put in a room with, say, a journalist from the Daily Mail or TechCrunch on their own for an hour? And I, and I wouldn't be worried. Right. Uh, I think probably the answer is zero. Of, of yeah, I think the answer is zero. Yeah. Maybe one. Maybe one. Yeah. Um, whereas at MailCloud, I'd be happy for any one of the team um, to be in a room with a journalist for now, um, because we've just put far more focus on the values that we have, the mission that we have, the vision that we have, understanding what is our kind of our why. That sort of Simon Sinek start with why. You know, what is it that we believe in? Why do we do what we do? What is our purpose? Um, and so that was definitely something that I think we learned the hard way um, at Zagora um, and, and, and able to kind of hopefully kind of instill that much more as a, as a sense in the team at, at MailCloud. Nice. Okay. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of concern as of late kind of around surrounding security in sure. terms of cloud computing. Yeah. Um, how have you guys approached that at MailCloud? And sure. Yeah, so the way that MailCloud works is that we really rely on your existing email account as a sort of intelligence source. Um, we think of it as a key that unlocks our service, and so whichever email provider you're currently using as an account, whether it's Exchange, Hosted, or Gmail, or Google Apps, or uh, Outlook, then it's that account that you have to connect. And so there's naturally you know, the emails, the files that are held on those provider servers, and then how it is that we then interface from the Dorian email provider to our large client-based service. And so we take security very seriously. It's one of the first things that we talked about when we were thinking about building this kind of a service. Um, we have around seven different levels of security. Um, we use 2048-bit encryption for everything. So both the communication, whether it's message or mail, it's in transit, or whether it's the actual files or emails that are sitting on our servers and the storage. Someone like Gmail, for instance, will use 2056-bit encryption just for the transit, not for storage whereas we use 2048-bit encryption for everything. Uh, that creates problems for us because you can't search, for instance, encrypted data. So users want to be able to search, need to be able to search. So how is it that we enable search? And so we had to develop some really interesting technology um, to kind of get around these things, but with the side benefit that we've got offline search. 
So when you use MailCloud, you can search all of your emails, your files, your emails, uh, messages when you're offline, on the tube, on the plane, um, the very few other clients, if any, actually allows you to do. Most of them kind of query the API when you've got a connection, if you haven't got a connection, sorry, you can't search, uh, whereas we can. So yeah, we take security very seriously. In terms of feedback that we've had from people, it's something that naturally comes up again and again. At the same time, security is not our kind of USP. Um, there are email client um, businesses out there, such as Proton Mail, based in Switzerland, where it is just all about security. Um, and so the keys to their encryption are not held on the server. So you have a key which with you encrypt your mail, you send it to me, I have the key that decrypts that mail. And there's no keys held on the server. Um, so if security is the sort of thing that you're after, if you're a spook or a spy, or you're an arms dealer or whatever, um, then you know a product like Proton Mail is probably far better for you. Um, if you want to put all of your communication and content in one place and have the ultimate productivity solution, then MailCloud is probably the product that you go for. Um, that is secure, but that isn't the big thing that we kind of really focus on. That's much more the productivity side. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so, email has kind of been around for yeah. you know, last, for as long as I can remember. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the only real way that people communicate at sure. work and whatever. Sure. Where do you see the future of email going? Yeah, so the interesting thing about email is that it really is how the world works. So there are something like 5 billion email accounts. Um, it's mind-boggling. There's 180 billion emails sent every single day. Um, and yet, if you talk to millennials, you know, 13 to 20 year old kids, uh, Generation K, Y, whatever they're called today, um, then they largely use Messenger. And email is something that your parents or grandparents use to communicate. Uh, and so when we've put in front of people interesting prototypes that look to um, kind of revolutionize or update or modernize the email experience by perhaps taking a more sort of federated kind of messaging approach. It doesn't matter whether it's a message or a mail, it's from this person. You just care about how what it says and how you're going to respond. People just freak out. I mean, users understand email. They may not like email. Everyone that I've ever spoken to in my life has a different issue with email, uh, a different problem that they want solving. Um, as a business, uh, in the business of email, it's not possible to really solve a problem for everyone. And so what we're trying to do is to offer people a better experience with email, rather than um, kind of radicalize the way that you use email or, or communicate with email. Um, love it or hate it, I think that the, the kind of disruption of mail as a, as a messaging format, because it's been around for so long, is going to be something that will be architected by a much bigger company than a startup. It's the kind of problem that you know, the Apples, the Googles, the Samsungs might if they want to try and solve. And so what we try and do is we try and take all the intelligence from your existing mail, offer you a mail experience which is familiar, but far more seamless um, than the kind of current fragmented way that you kind of use your email, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time a little bit, so my last question for you is, um, what kind of advice do you have for a prospective uh, sort of tech startup who, who, who are looking for investment? Yeah, so, I mean, a question that I actually get asked an awful lot is what makes a successful entrepreneur uh, or what makes a successful startup? And I don't know, um, it's logical, but I don't know any entrepreneurs that are successful that didn't do it. They all did it, right? They all actually went out and started the business, talked to the investor, uh, created a product, went and got customers. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that have entrepreneurial uh, visions and, and, and dreams um, the, and, and, and <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, it's the fear of failure. It's a big thing that people really have to get over. Um, you have to accept that whatever you do in life is going to fail and just be comfortable with that. And if it fails, that's fine. You can just do something else. That is the way of the samurai. Is yeah. it? And you embrace that. Um, I think advice for startups is that um, it really is a golden age. I mean, we, we live in a golden age of it has never been cheaper uh, to start a startup. Software tools are literally free now in a way that about 10 years ago you'd have to pay. There has never been so many uh, users in the world that carry around a supercomputer in their pocket, right? There are two billion people now with smartphones. Each of them has uh, a supercomputer in their pocket. And so the speed at which you can develop a user base and roll out a product has never been so fast. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, there's never been so much capital available to support startups. Um, institutional capital has grown and grown. The amounts raised in Europe get bigger every year. $1.5 billion was invested just in London last year by VCs. Okay, in Silicon Valley, it's like 80 billion. But still, 1.5 billion was the biggest ever. Uh, crowdfunding, accessibility, and cost of capital is, is, is cheaper than ever. So if you really are thinking about starting a startup, it is the best time ever in history, probably, to do that.
uh, if it's in the digital or tech space. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much.